So now that we have all of our different predicates and quantifiers defined and we understand these things, we want to understand how they interact with our other logical operators, like our ands, our nots, our ors, etc. So all of this is contained in Rosen's section 1.4.6 through 1.4.9. And before we actually discuss how our quantifiers interact with our different logical operators, we need to do a little bit of prep work. So do you remember back when I was talking about precedence of operators? So which ones you evaluate first? Now that we have new symbols, for all and there exists and there exists a unique, we're gonna have to update that order of operations. So in particular, it's pretty simple. Quantifiers take top precedence. So if you were to consider our operators in the order of the precedence, it would look as follows. Great. So our quantifiers take top precedence right here. So for example, if I were to say for every x, p of x and not q of x, if I were to say this right here, this thing here means the parentheses are around the entire expression right here. So this quantifier right here, this universal quantifier takes top precedence and that's what it means. It does not mean it does not mean this. So remember that this is a convention just so we don't have to write a whole bunch of parentheses. So whenever you see an expression like this, that means that this quantifier applies to whatever comes after it unless you have explicitly put down different parentheses. So this statement and this statement are not the same thing. Whenever you don't have any parentheses, you assume that the parentheses are around the entire thing that comes after your quantifier over here. The next thing that we have to worry about is a thing called scope. So for scope, this is what happens when, or what we need to consider when our expression has multiple different quantifiers in it. So if you consider something like this expression right here. Well, by order of operations, we already saw that by the very fact that I've put parentheses right here, I know that I mean this universal quantifier right here applies to that proposition, or, and then this existential quantifier applies to this particular functional proposition right here. And so whenever I talk about scope, I'm talking about this y right here, there existing a y, refers to this particular propositional function right here. And I mean that this x refers to this entire expression right here. So the scope of this quantifier is this expression, and the scope of this quantifier for its variable is that particular expression. The reason why I'm bringing this up is that in practice, unfortunately, usually they use, and by they I mean people who write textbooks and problems, etc., use the same symbol. So if you were to see something like, this, these two statements are logically equivalent. All I've done is replace this y with an x right here. However, the scope 
of these different quantifiers are still the same. Even though I have an X right here and an X right here, I know that this X is only referring to this compound expression right here. And I know that this X and this exists X is only applying to this R of X right here. So you have to be careful, even though that's an X and that's an X, this one right here only applies to that particular proposition and this X is applying to that particular proposition right there. So that's what I mean by scope. Be careful that when you're considering a statement like this to treat as distinct for all X in this statement and there exists X in this statement, there are different kinds of X's. They have different scopes. Lastly, we now need to update our definition of logical equivalence. So now that we have quantifiers, we can have these propositional functions in here. So I need to update what I mean by logical equivalence when my particular proposition might have quantifiers and these predicates and predicate functions over here. So Whew, boy howdy, that is a big definition right there. But all it's saying is we say that two statements are logically equivalent and we still use our logical equivalence symbol right here. If and only if they take on the same truth value, that's what we had before, but now we're updating it with no matter the domain under consideration and no matter what the propositional functions stand for. So, your statements have to be true no matter what the domains are and no matter what P of X or Q of X or R of X, et cetera, what those things actually stand for. So for example, a little bit later on, we are going to see that the following is true. not for every x, p of x, is logically equivalent to there exists an x such that not p of x. For this thing to be logically equivalent, for this statement to be logically equivalent to that statement right here, it can't matter the domain under consideration and it can't matter what p of x is. So p of x could be anything x squared is greater than x, or x plus two equals zero, or this computer talks to that computer, or something like yeah. this. Doesn't matter what these propositional functions right here stand for, this has to be true. They have to take on the same truth values for these two to be logically equivalent. Similarly, it doesn't, it can't matter the domain of these quantifiers right here. So it can't matter if I'm restricting my domain down to like exclude zero or be a finite domain or be all real numbers, et cetera. For these two to be logically equivalent, this left-hand side has to be true for every domain and every possible propositional function P. It has to take on the same truth value as this right-hand side right here for any domain and any propositional function. As long as I'm considering the same domains on both sides and the same propositional functions on both sides. And we will see a number of examples of logical equivalence and actually proving logical equivalence. Great.
So that's all we need to be able to then move on to figuring out how these different quantifiers then interact with and, or, and not.